Ladies and gentlemen, there... Mesdames, Messieurs, je voudrais vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cette euh, réunion. Donc, c'est pour euh, le secteur industriel. Donc, je suis heureux de vous voir aussi. Nous. And that your expectation of what I guess is your expectation that this will be a fruitful and interesting seminar will be fulfilled. Um, well, if it's not, it's certainly not because of um, that we would have chosen the wrong panelists because we're absolutely thrilled and delighted to have, um, have the gentlemen who are sitting up here and the one in the first row here as the panelists on the two different panels that we will be uh, listening to and discussing with. And uh, we will have Shireen Wheeler, who most of you maybe know from TV because she hosts the um, BBC talk show, The Record Europe. She will moderate this event and will make sure that everybody, well, that nobody, uh, so to say, monopolizes the speaking time and that most of you who would like to make a contribution or have a question can al also bring that forward. So my colleague, George Lyon, and myself, we are both involved in... Um, the EU-Canada trade agreement in uh, different ways and we thought it's a good point in time to come forward with such a seminar because uh, we've been seeing the negotiations going back and forth for a while now and um, all of you are aware of that we are trying to bring the negotiations to a conclusion rather sooner than possible. We hopefully hear more about a specific date of uh, the ambassador or of um, uh, Philippe Dupuis, who is the deputy uh, chief negotiator on CETA from the European side. But um, just to give you a few figures why um, George and myself believe that CETA would be good, um, we can see just that from the Canadian side, the EU is Canada's second biggest trading partner. For the EU, Canada is the 12th biggest trading partner, so it's still among the top 20. And the total value of the bilateral trade is one of those figures with enormous uh, number of zeros behind it's 52.5 billion in last year. And um, there is a joint study which uh, Professor Francois will surely elaborate a bit on, uh, which gave the um, uh, possible impact of trade liberalization between Canada and the EU. And the Canadian side did a very interesting exercise. They broke the figures down to a kitchen table uh, increase in value, and they came to almost 1,000 Canadian dollars per kitchen table per family in Canada uh, of a benefit that um, CETA would bring to the Canadian people. So, in 2009, the negotiations were launched. That's now um, a while ago. But um, in um, 2011, when a delegation also from the European Parliament's intercommittee went to Ottawa and Toronto, we hoped that we would very soon see a closing of those negotiations. And Peter Stastny, who we have um, the honor to have him here, who is the rapporteur of, um, of the intercommittee on Canada and specifically on the, the Canada uh, trade agreement, we, we hope that from now on things will go smoothly. And um, we still have that hope because we would like to have it concluded and ratified and signed and done and dealt with as long uh, before the next elections because uh, that's something we would not like to see um, to take too much time. And um, we need CETA. Why? Well, first of all, transatlantic economic relations are very important. Our friends from across the Atlantic, we would like to have them close to us and I hope that feeling is mutual. And um, we would like, as the WTO Doha round negotiations are blocked, um, to have that network of free trade agreement which are bilateral and which are incre increasingly increasing in numbers, that this is, um, um, is very strong among countries which possibly share a lot of values, share a lot of background, share history. And so that's why I think a uh, free trade agreement between Canada and the EU should be um, should be a rather quick and easy 
exercise compared to maybe negotiations with other parts of the world, if I may say so. And um, as we can see that Europe is negotiating with a lot of regions of the world, we also see that Canada is doing the same. And I guess um, the interest there, and the ambassador might enlighten us on that, is also to maybe diversify a bit and not be too much and or only the little brother, little sister of, of the bigger neighbor, but also gain a few more, a bit more independence when it comes to when it comes to trade. So what is the European Parliament to do with this? Why are we not, why are we doing the seminar? What's, what's our role in that? Well, we have the Lisbon Treaty, you're all aware of that. It's a new role for European Parliament also in trade issues. And um, we take this role very seriously. We have to give our consent to any kind of trade agreement. And um, um, that's why we also are involved somehow in the negotiations, specifically as the Commissioner de Gucht, uh, already had committed himself to always involve Parliament very closely. So, um, and once the negotiations are concluded, it's not that kind of on Monday you conclude the negotiation, on Tuesday the agreement enters into force, it then takes another year to be translated in all languages, to do kind of legal wording and uh, plenty of other formal activities. So we like um, this uh, to the negotiations to conclude as soon as possible, as I already said, in order to not make this delay too significant. So there are a few open chapters. Our second panel will mainly focus on that and give some, give some insight on that. And um, Shirin Wheeler will introduce all the panelists and um, say, well, explain to you why these are the best possible uh, speakers on the various issues. And um, also, I would like to just conclude by saying that, that um, from a European perspective, there are, there are many things that uh, we just see or like about Canada, and it's never been seen as a complicated relationship and uh, I would love to see that, that CETA um, reduces the uh, kilometer distance <laughs> if it's not physically possible but, but psychologically uh, between Canada and the EU uh, because trade and open trade in my, from my point of view can do a lot, can bring people closer together and um, this would be a wonderful outcome of CETA. So I look very much forward to now hearing from the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana. Thanks all of you uh, for coming. Now, just on a practical point, I think uh, there will be interpretation if you need it, uh, probably uh, in about five minutes, if not already. And it will be in uh, English and German. And there might be a little bit of a break in our microphones when that happens. So don't worry, panelists, because uh, it will be sorted out. Um, so Silvana's run through uh, what we're going to do. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our panelists here. Um, and like to sort of stress, we've got some time at, uh, when we've heard from them each briefly. We will uh, invite you to make some comments, ask some questions, uh, both uh, to, to ask them questions questions, but also get, give them the opportunity, actually, to hear what uh, you all have to say as well, um, in the spirit of um, openness and transparency. Um, and also, perhaps, to explore together um, where, if there is a slowing down of the timetable, uh, where that is, why that is, uh, where the uh, progress is being made, where it isn't uh, being made so fast, and, uh, and therefore, uh, we really have the right people here to, uh, to tell us a little bit about that. So on my left, I have um, David Plunkett, who is the ambassador of Canada to the EU. And you were very involved in the lead up to these negotiations and, of course, continue to play uh, a big role in, uh, in giving them uh, political direction uh, and uh, sort of, you know, abreast of all of them every inch of the way. On my right, uh, you're really dealing with the meat of it all, Philippe uh, Dupuis from the European Commission. Um, Philippe is the deputy negotiator, um, so you'll give us a sense of uh, where we are with these talks, uh, the state of play, and um, Joe, uh, Joseph Francois from uh, the uh, Kepler University in Linz. Um, you have written and, in fact, informed the commission, uh, Commission's own Department of Trade on how the effect of this, uh, this agreement 
uh, could play out, who would benefit, where the benefits would be on both sides. So we'll hear a bit more about that. But let me ask you, first of all, um, Ambassador, uh, to give us a sense, a bit of an oversight, a bit of context um, to this agreement and, and why um, it is important, actually, in your view. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, honorable uh, members of parliament, fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Madam Chair, uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting us, uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to speak about uh, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, which uh, will hereafter be called CETA. Uh, Canada's Chief Negotiator, Steve Rahul, uh, would have liked to have been here today. Uh, to participate here, but he's uh, currently uh, traveling across Canada, meeting with various stakeholders, so he asked me if I could uh, cover for him. Uh, let me start by expressing our appreciation to the organizers for, for providing this opportunity, and I, and I welcome the, uh, uh, the interest uh, in exploring the implications for industry, and obviously by the uh, wide turnout today, there's, uh, there's uh, great interest in this uh, ongoing negotiation. Um, in terms of context, let, let me s uh, set the stage a bit here. Um, as everyone is obviously aware, uh, these are challenging times for Europe with the ongoing, ongoing uncertainty stemming from the sovereign debt and banking crisis, which has created significant risk to the global economy. Uh, recent developments in Europe are being monitored very closely, and we continue to encourage the EU to take all the necessary measures to swiftly put this crisis behind you. I say that because as part of these efforts, Europe's leaders are keenly focused on encouraging economic growth. Uh, yesterday on the eve of this week's important summit, uh, President Barroso gave a speech which called on the European Council to give strong impetus to the growth agenda, noting uh, also that external trade is a key source of European growth. Trade Commissioner de Gucht has stated that external trade constitutes the fastest growing contribution to the EU's growth and is likely to remain so uh, for the foreseeable future, making it a fundamental component of Europe's economic recovery. Uh, we could go on with many other quotes of similar type. International trade will therefore be central to the economic recovery of the EU, and the EU could have no stronger international trading partner than Canada. The outlook for the Canadian economy remains strong. Uh, we have recovered all of the output and all of the jobs lost during the recession of 2008-2009. As of May 2012, our unemployment rate stood at 7.3%. For 2012, uh, the Bank of Canada predicts a 2.5% uh, real growth uh, in GDP. According to the IMF, our net debt-to-GDP ratio is estimated at 35% for 2011, uh, which makes the debt burden less than half of that of the closest G7 country. The World Economic Forum rated Canada's banking system as the world's soundest, and major credit agencies, uh, rating agencies have reaffirmed our AAA ratings. Uh, our government's most uh, recent budget focuses uh, uh, and maintains a focus on jobs and economic growth while reducing the deficit and returning to balance in the medium term. Apart from just showing off by, by listing all these statistics, I, I actually am just highlighting our economic strengths to underscore what an important partner Canada is and will continue to be for the EU. Uh, this year will be an important and exciting year for that partnership. We are moving forward on a number of significant negotiations. Uh, the immense diversity in number is testament to the vitality of our bilateral relationship. Of particular importance are the CETA and the Strategic Partnership Agreement, in addition to uh, a number of other specific sectoral agreements. On the CETA, uh, the CETA is a priority for both the Canadian and European political leaders. Canada's Minister of International Trade, the Honourable Ed Fast, and Commissioner de Gucht have both stated their expectation that negotiations could be concluded by the end of this year. The CETA will offer advantages to businesses in both Canada and the European Union. The joint study uh, carried out by Canada and the European Union in 2008 uh, in part uh, by our, our colleague on the panel here, uh, found that an ambitious free trade agreement could increase bilateral trade by 20%, which would have obvious uh, positive impact on un unemployment in both, on both sides of the Atlantic. 
A Canada-EU agreement will provide European companies with a gateway into the large North American free trade area while increasing Canadian opportunities in the European market, the world's largest. Notably, some tangible gains for industry will be increased ease of investment, greater access to markets and goods and services, an expanded ability to tap into highly skilled workforces, and greater ease of doing business for importers and exporters through enhanced regulatory cooperation. Concluding, the CETA will also send a strong signal to the rest of the world that Canada and the EU reject economic protectionism and are committed to opening markets. Within the WTO, both partners adopted the anti-protectionist pledge and are making steps to actualizing these promises. If two industrialized and like-minded partners like Canada and the EU can reach an ambitious agreement, it will reinforce the message to the rest of the world about the importance of further liberalizing trade. Since launching CETA in 2009, Can Canadian and EU negotiators have maintained an ambitious pace with nine full negotiating rounds having been held so far. Our negotiators are now engaging in intensive technical discussions on a range of issues. The last such meeting took place in Ottawa during the week of June 4, and another is scheduled to take place in Brussels in mid-July. Seating negotiators continue to work towards concluding these negotiations this year, as I mentioned earlier. Canadian provinces and territories are committed to an ambitious outcome in these negotiations and are actively engaged in this, in this process. Federal and provincial and territorial governments have all recognized the benefits of an agreement which would bring, uh, benef recognize the benefits an agreement would bring to every region of Canada, stating in a joint communique in February 2012, quote, there is no more important Canadian trade negotiating priority than the Canadian-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. Uh, and uh, we uh, have provincial uh, uh, representatives here um, uh, in the audience. The remaining tough issues yet to be worked through include, but are not limited to, rules of origin for industrial and agricultural products, intellectual property rights, market access for agricultural goods, and rules in, on investment. As anyone involved with trade negotiations will tell you, in order to get a, to a final agreement, both sides will have to make concessions. What we are now trying to accomplish in many of these areas is to bridge different approaches and positions. Canada believes that finding solutions to the sensitive issues will be made easier if we maintain a high level of ambition across the agreement. If we fail to achieve a deep and comprehensive result, we will miss a unique opportunity to achieve real market access for Canadian and EU companies and economic gains for our citizens. Throughout these negotiations, both sides have been working in a co cooperative and constructive manner. This goodwill and joint focus on achieving an ambitious outcome will have been the hallmarks of these negotiations and will be extremely important to maintain as we work to, uh, through the final stages. A quick word on another of our ongoing negotiations, the strategic partnership. Uh, our objective is very clear. We wish to lift Canada-EU relations to a higher level. Uh, our ambition for this agreement uh, flows from a recognition of the breadth, maturity, and diversity of our relationship. Um, and uh, we have made good progress in these negotiations uh, with the majority of texts uh, more or less being agreed upon, expressing our shared values and commitment on a range of issues, particularly human rights and international security. The last remaining issue to be resolved is the EU's insistence on the inclusion of suspensive or political clauses uh, we continue to believe that this agreement should be a standalone and an evergreen document, uh, and we are working with the EU to try to develop an innovative solution to address both sides' needs. Uh, in closing, um, as two uh, advanced democratic economies and societies, Canada and the EU enjoy a robust relationship through, but it, in it inevitably will, as with all relationships, have some challenges. Two of these challenging issues are getting a lot of attention these days in both Canada and the EU. I'm referring to the proposed treatment of Canada's oil sands, crude in the draft implementing measures on the EU's fuel quality directive, and to Canada's visa policy with respect to Bulgaria, Romania, and the Czech Republic. On both these issues, it's important to remember that Canada and the EU share common goals. We support the objective of the Fuel Quality Directive to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we have serious concerns with the discriminatory nature of, the proposed, of its proposed implementation. 
on visas. Our ultimate goal is to offer visa-free travel to nationals of all, I repeat, all nationals from EU member states. At the moment, however, there are still elements that need to be uh, addressed so that we can achieve this goal. And I want to emphasize that the EU must share responsibility in finding a solution to this problem of mutual concern. We will continue to work with member state governments and the Commission on these and other issues in a spirit of cooperation. These issues remain separate from the CETA negotiations and our intention is to find solutions that will bridge our differences in a way that will not impact on the ongoing CETA negotiations and the important economic benefits this agreement will bring to both sides. Finally, in conclusion, I'd like to reaffirm our commitment to deepening relations with the EU. The European Parliament will play a key role in reviewing and consenting to the agreements that our skilled negotiators deliver. I look forward to continuing to meet with members of Parliament, including uh, the CETA Rapporteur, Mr. Stasny, and members of the Inter Committee, uh, Committee's Canada Monitoring Group, in order to exchange views on these agreements and their importance of our bilateral relationship. Events like this one hosted today are an extremely useful way to engage in that discussion. And I'll, I'll stop here to give some time for uh, uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving us such a good overview of the issues and, and some of the issues that aren't necessarily related to uh, the uh, negotiations, but of course uh, do hang over them to some extent. And we know here at the European Parliament they've been subject of various resolutions and oral questions. We can come back to some of those issues, but uh, I'd like to ask um, Philippe Dupuis. I mean, the ambassador obviously gave us a, a sense there of. Uh, the overview, and also I think that the sense that this is crunch time actually for these negotiations, aren't they? Do you have a, do you have a feeling that things are getting bogged down uh, because they clearly have slowed up a bit and, and, and there is a slight worry that they're not going to make the, the timetable? Or is this what normally happens? Where, where, how, is the, uh, how are the talks going? Give us a sense as you're involved in them, uh, presumably pretty much every day these days. Yes, every day and night. Um, <laughs> so, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you first to the ALD and also in particular to, to Ms. koch for, uh, for this invitation. I think it's a good moment to, to maybe give a, give a state of play uh, of where we, we stand in these, uh, in these CETA negotiations. Uh, I will answer your, your question at the end, maybe, or, or in course. Um, I mean, basically, uh, we have been negotiating now for two and a half years. Uh, we are very much advanced, but this is normal for any negotiation. Uh, what, what is kept to the end is what is more, more difficult to bridge. But why is it more difficult to bridge, and this is uh, clear in this negotiation as in, in any other negotiation, is it's the areas where uh, our legal systems or our economic uh, structures differ. So there is more, more to bridge. So this is absolutely normal. I think the, um, uh, the point here, and which was already mentioned by Ambassador Plunkett, is that we, uh, uh, we work with the, the Canadian colleagues in an extremely uh, constructive and uh, forward-looking spirit in, in order to try to, uh, to find the middle ground on some of the issues, these issues on, on which I will come, uh, briefly come back. Uh, where do we stand uh, overall? Uh, let me maybe first talk about market access um, and then about, uh, let's say, the rules or the text uh, briefly. On market access, uh, we usually look at, uh, at three areas. We look at the market access in goods, we look at uh, services investment, and we look at public procurement. Now, on goods, uh, we have uh, currently a situation where over 99% of the tariff lines are already covered. For this, uh, for this agreement in terms of liberalization. I mean, this can go up to seven years in terms of dismantling. Uh, and there are still some, some uh, products which are out there, which are products which are of a particular sensitivity for, for both sides, and which we haven't discussed yet. They are in the, in the agriculture sector, and uh, this is something we will um, come back to uh, in, uh, in the negotiation in due time, but as you can see already from the coverage, it's, uh, it's a re re relatively minor, uh, minor part if you look at the overall economic relationship uh, which, is, which is left, which, which is nevertheless uh, important and has, has some interest uh, behind. On, uh, on service investment, uh, you know, on, on services, uh, what are we doing in the, on the European side? We are, of course, striving to 
to get uh, an opening from Canada which goes uh, a little bit beyond NAFTA. Mm -hmm. so we uh, would like to, to have access to the, to the services markets. That's normal. We are a strong services economy in Europe, and we would like to, to, uh, um, to be able to, to work with Canada as vice versa. Canada is equally a strong, strong service economy, so um, it works both ways. Um, we also would like to have uh, further openings on, on investment, on investment possibilities. Um, as was mentioned before, investment is a key, key element of our relationship. Uh, Canada is the fourth biggest investor in the European Union. The EU is the second investor in Canada. So in a way, um, the economic relationship is, is much more uh, determined by the investment relationship than just by just, uh, you know, uh, sending back and forth uh, goods. So there's much more uh, behind it. And uh, it's, of course, interesting. Uh, both sophisticated economies, it's interesting for, for our uh, operators to be able to, uh, to invest on, on both sides. Here there's uh, still uh, the one or the other issue which is, uh, which is open uh, and uh, we're looking for on, uh, on, on the Canadian side. The third element is public procurement. Uh, that was one of our uh, main interests in this negotiation. Why? Because so far Canada has always committed its federal level uh, to the third countries, to the EU, in terms of, of market access. But of course, uh, Canada as a, as a uh, federal state is, uh, has enormous markets at the sub-federal level, at the level of the provinces and of the municipalities. And so far, uh, Canada did not have any, any obligation to treat our, our operators on an equal footing. So uh, we, had a, we had an interest in that. Uh, we flagged this uh, very early before the negotiation started. Uh, we must uh, also recognize uh, to, the, to the credit of Canada that uh, there has been a big effort and what we currently have on the table in terms of, of potential opening I mean, everything remains conditional until everything is closed. This is, is the rule in the negotiations, in any negotiation. Uh, what is on the table uh, goes uh, far beyond what, uh, what Canada has, has opened or committed to anybody else before. So this is, is important. Uh, but there are still some gaps in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this offer. And uh, these are, again, gaps where we would like to, to get in, or areas we'd like to get in because they are economically interesting. Uh, for us. So this is something which uh, still needs to be uh, looked at uh, further down in the, in the negotiation. But I think what, uh, what is there in terms of market access overall, already now in all the three areas, is, is quite something. Uh, if we close today, we would have a very ambitious agreement, but we would like to get uh, uh, to do the full, full mile on this. Um, now, the second part is uh, relating to, let's say, more the text issues, uh, the rules issues. Uh, here, uh, the question of, uh, you know, where, how our systems play, how our systems are, comes a bit more into, into play. Uh, there's one important area which we have to look at uh, and which is extremely time consuming, that's the rules of origin. Uh, rules of origin are the rules which, uh, which uh, define a product as being from Canada or from the uh, European Union and therefore to be beneficiary of the preferential conditions of the agreement. If you don't have that, you risk that uh, uh, products from countries which are not part of a preferential agreement flow under the agreement and get preferential treatment. That means that uh, you know, products from China via Europe get into Canada at, uh, uh, with tariff preferences or Indian products via, via, via Canada, just to, just to give an example. So these are quite important, and uh, the rules of origin are also important in order to be able to determine what the real value of these tariff offers that we have now are. The point is the EU has its own rules of origin system. Canada, which is very much integrated in NAFTA, has its own. They are different, and we need to find a common ground. So this is complex. It's a big book of, of, uh, of uh, rules per uh, uh, per product, so to say. So it's, it's a complex and long uh, negotiation, but uh, we are making good progress there. Uh, there's other areas that we, uh, we continue to tackle, which are advanced, but uh, which uh, uh, need to be uh, finalized as well. That's, that's SPS, where, uh, so sanitary and phytosanitary measures, where our systems differ as well. 
and need to be uh, bridged. Uh, we are, um, have uh, offensive interest from the European side on intellectual property rights, uh, notably on pharmaceutical patents, <coughs> uh, where we would like to, to, um, to create a level playing field between uh, the EU and Canada. Um, we talk still about GIs, um, and we, we also talk, of course, about, uh, about investment protection now, since this has become a uh, EU competence. And, uh, uh, of course, here uh, it's a new field. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting new approach. And we, uh, we need to find uh, a common ground here as well with Canada, which has much more experience uh, in, that, uh, in that area than the EU has not as the member states have. The member states have, have been um, uh, negotiating uh, investment protection agreements for quite some time already, but, uh, but let's say there's, there's now 27 approaches that we need to bring, to bring uh, together. So this is also an internal exercise. Let me also mention maybe at, uh, as a very last, uh, I don't want to be exhaustive here, but uh, uh, the, uh, that we, we would like to facilitate the temporary movement of, of highly qualified professionals, so uh, managers, financial experts, uh, uh, lawyers, uh, you name it. I think this is, this is in, in, in the interest of the investors who would like to be able to move uh, back and forth uh, their specialized uh, personnel. Uh, we would also like uh, to, um, uh, or we have created a framework for the mutual recognition of professional qualifications. It can only be a framework. Then the, the professional associations need to bring their individual agreements of mutual recognition into, into CETA. But it, it's an interesting new approach that we do for the first time with, uh, in the framework of, the, of an FTA with CETA, and which also benefits more directly the, uh, the citizens. Um, I leave it at that for the moment. Uh, of course, happy to, to answer further questions. Let me just uh, say that uh, we are not bogged down. We are simply in a, in a phase where, by nature, we need to tackle a set of, of, uh, of issues which have more, let's say, more difference in, in, it, in itself. That's, uh, that's normal. But we are very well on track to finalize this year. Uh, we, uh, um, we are optimistic that, uh, that this, would, this will work out. And there's no sign uh, pointing it to another direction. So I think this is, this is very well on track. Um, but a negotiation is a negotiation, so you cannot give a precise date. You can just put yourself deadlines and try to, uh, you know, to, to keep the momentum, keep the pressure, uh, the steam. Um, but uh, I think we, we should be able to, to manage it. Um, the rest is also, of course, the politics around it, which, uh, which we'll play. So I leave it at that. And uh, Thank you. Thank to. you very much. Um, that, that Really fascinating uh, insight, and thank you for identifying uh, for us, actually, uh, where some of the stickier issues are. Um, very interesting what you say about the recognition of qualifications, and, and also clearly, as you said, there's a, you're, you're straying into something of a political minefield as well in terms of the sub-federal level. Um, we understand that is where in Canada there's been some uh, coverage of this as well. We maybe will come back to that, but I'm mindful of the time. Um, we've slightly started a bit late, but so Joe, um, uh, let me ask you to give us, uh, in your work, you've been looking at the sort of overall benefits either side of this. Can you run us through that fairly, fairly swiftly uh, so we have time from the audience uh, to ask uh, some points as well, uh, as we're so uh, delighted to have these gentlemen, including you, Joe, here. Okay. Um, again, like the others, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation today. Um, what I'll focus on is just some food for thought in terms of why the agreement and which, um, uh, why the issues that are the sticking points now are actually important. And in particular, uh, stressing productivity gains. I mean, a big part of the gains or potential gains out of this agreement follows through productivity and investment impacts and how that leads into labor markets, jobs, and, and wages. Um, part of what drives it is just the, the relative size of the trade agreement, so I mean, of, of the trade flow. So um, we're hearing about detailed issues with specific products and specific um, specific sectors and points. But overall, I mean, the EU is Canada's second major trading partner. Um, if you look at historically the strength of the trade relationship, even when NAFTA was implemented and Canadian U.S. trade took off from that, the the Canadian EU trade remained strong and tracked well over that period. 
Um, Canada is more important, especially if you look forward, than Japan, for example, in terms of trade shares and expected growth over time. Um, and if we think about the different types of agreements that the EU has been negotiating and the regional focus, so uh, Latin America, for example, is clearly those agreements are quite important to Spain and Portugal. Um, the enlargement of the EU itself was important to the, to the Central European economies in terms of the geographic focus. For some member states, Canada really uh, stands out as, as a trade partner. So the UK, for example, Canada is about 4% of external trade, which is more than twice the, the average European level. So for individual member states, this is actually quite important. In each of these agreements for different member states, this, these things are, these agreements are important. Um, in terms of the sectors and the reason why we're hearing that things like uh, investment and um, like procurement matter, this is a case where we've got uh, two well-developed economies that are very service intensive. And one thing that comes out on the big picture of where the potential gains are is actually on services. Um, in terms of the flows, services are a much more dominant share than on average, say, if you're negotiating with, uh, with, with Mercosur or East Asia. Uh, the barriers, it turns out, are also quite high on both sides. Or I, I guess I should call these measures and not barriers, right? We're not supposed to be judgmental. So those differences in regulations and rules that lead to higher costs when European firms go into Canada and vice versa. Uh, one thing that came out of the, the scoping studies was that those were quite high in terms of the cost impacts. And those are not taxes that are collected. It's not that somebody's really gaining from that. It's just wasted resources. So these are sources of potentially large productivity gains, uh, which translates into higher demand for workers, higher efficiency. And much of that is in services. And those barriers, or sorry, those measures, um, are partly in foreign investment rules and regulations. It partly relates to these procurement rules at the subfederal level, not just federal. And so those are important because, you know, that's actually where a lot of the substantive estimated benefits will be when, when all is said and done. And so the time that's being spent, and if it does take longer to get this sorted out, it's worth it. Um, because that's actually where a good bit of the, um, the estimated gains will come from. An observation just on rules of origin, which is when the NAFTA was first signed, it was about yay thick, right? couple pages, and then they started adding the rules of origin chapters, and it grew to about phone book size. So yeah, it's not surprising that that's complex and that, that will take a good bit of time to sort through. And now we have two phone books that we're trying to collate and kind of sort and see if we can find common ground on. Uh, it, it takes time. But again, the underlying benefits, and those rules, by the way, even not just services, but for goods trade, given the volume of trade, uh, it, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, the value is quite large, and a, a modest percent on a big number can still be big. And so the potential cost savings, again, the productivity gains from harmonizing those rules on, on the good side as well are actually quite large. And again, this relates in part to foreign investment, also product standard recognitions, and so on. And so the big picture was that um, it's actually not the tariffs. It's the hard stuff. And it's the stuff they're bogged down on. but there's reason to push through with this. And I'll, I'll stop with that since we need to go to discussion. Okay. So. Uh, that's great. Now, let me ask uh, you uh, on the floor, first of all, I think, it would be nice to uh, see if anyone's got any questions uh, you want to put immediately uh, to our panel. There's a gentleman there. Uh, I know I've got some, but I'm going to hold back myself. Mr. Schultz wants to make a point, and then there's a gentleman back there. So let's take these three points and questions, and then, um, so uh, you've got a little button on your microphone. If you want to press that before you speak, yes. Thank that's you. It. If you could uh, say where you're from. Yes, yes. You. My name is Don Kenyon from the Australian National University in Canberra. And I'd like to ask uh, Ambassador Plunkett if he could tell us a little more about the strategic partnership agreement that he mentioned at the beginning of his remarks, and what relationship that has, if any, to the CETA negotiations currently taking place. Okay. Um, right, we'll come back to that. Thank you. What university were you from? Welcome to Brussels. Uh, okay. Um, gentleman there. Thank you very much. I'm Jonathan Peel. I chair the trade group of the 
European Economic and Social Committee, and we've been following these negotiations very closely. I was interested that none of the speakers mentioned the whole question of sustainable development. A key factor of the free trade agreement with Korea, which came into effect nearly a year ago, was a chapter on sustainable development. And as importantly, there was a chapter set uh, to, to monitor this was set up the Civil Society Forum, where a group of civil society was able to monitor the implementation of the social development chapter. And we had our first meeting this morning, and there were four people, including myself, with an industry business background. Is there a proposal to have a sustainable development chapter? And is there a proposal to have a civil society forum to monitor it? Thank you. OK, thank you for that. And then um, Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Madam the Pan Parliament, also from the International Trade Committee. Um, and I have two questions. One question to uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador. Uh, we had already several times the, the chance to debate, and I would uh, ask what is just the current state of play in the relationship between the provinces and their participation and uh, in the federal approach to this uh, CETA agreement? Are there new developments? Are there total agreement, etc.? Um, and secondly, from the European side, it would be the question to you, Mr. Dupuy. Um, uh, we heard a lot of concern that through this CETA agreement uh, we are g getting on the North American market and that for the close um, interlinkage between the United States market and Canadian uh, industries, uh, the American, the United States uh, could have an easily access to the European market. And while we are discussing the, the questions of will be there a, a trade, uh, any kind of trade agreement be, be, uh, between the United States and the European Union, what uh, is just here the current uh, state of play in this relationship? Thank you. Okay, so let's um, let's deal with these questions, and then we can come back. Uh, can I just have a sense of anybody else who wants to make a point? Okay, not at the moment, but that's fine. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, the gentleman here from uh, from the university ambassador. I think it was a question to you. Can you answer that uh, about the um, strategic partnership agreement and its relationship to the current? one being talked about? Yeah, the, the strategic partnership agreement is, is, is in rough uh, strokes, basically uh, an updating of our um, uh, political architecture with the, with the European Union. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, an agreement that the Europeans uh, are, are negotiating with a number of partners, including Australia, uh, uh, at this point in time, and it, it's trying to to uh, update um, um, an architecture that's from from our first bilateral agreement that goes back into 1979. And and the point I was trying to make is that we believe as as we're moving forward on this uh, agreement uh, that it it should reflect the realities and provide the basis on which we can continue to expand and uh, and, and and collaborate in, in a whole range of areas. Um, and and um, you know a focus on this has been on on the ways you express your shared values and commitment on a wide range of issues such as human rights and international security. Um, and 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 largely, and I think with also with other countries, uh, there's there's a fair bit of common ground here. Uh, where we a number of us are stumbling is is the linkages or the attempted linkages between uh, a, a, um, a political agreement and a, and these trade agreements or, or, or whatnot. And so we are, uh, as I said, trying to ensure that this is a stand a standalone agreement that reinforces sends out a very positive message that we are uh, are very much together uh, with the European on a, on on 99.9 percent .9 of of human rights proliferation issues and and we 
just don't think that an agreement which is trying to send a positive signal uh, should um, uh, should be sort of overwhelmed with a with a, uh, a penalty clause. So we continue to uh, discuss this. Uh, we are looking to uh, exchanging uh, draft language to try to find a way through this that meets both our, our particular needs. We'll come back to uh, the the other questions uh, to you, Ambassador, as well. But can I ask you, Philippe, to uh, ad address that question about sustainable development? I mean, actually, I have a note here that this was one of the things that the Parliament was particularly concerned about uh, that should feature in negotiation. And I think the supplementary question to that was, will there be a civil society high-level forum to monitor this as well? So is this featuring? And if not, why not? Or if so, where? Yes, uh, thanks for uh, that question. That's, of course, an important, uh, important element. Um, and as you know, it's an important element in all our agreements. Um, we have, uh, we will have a sustainable, sustainable development chapter in CETA. We will have uh, a labor and an environment chapter in CETA. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, share uh, the same objectives with Canada. I think this is, uh, we are both on the same, uh, on the same line here. Uh, there is uh, elements, of course, which still need to, need, to be, need to be negotiated in the end. You know, there's a lot also in the detail and how you weight the different, uh, the different uh, ambitions, uh, what you want to have in, etc. cetera. But, uh, but overall, we are, uh, it's not uh, as such a controversial issue. And of course, we would like to have a mechanism which uh, which allows the uh, you know the, the the coming in of the of the civil society. Uh, that's clear, uh, and we will follow uh, let's say the track which has been been uh, taken in, in our previous agreements. That's that's clear. Um, I uh, you know this is a is a matter of, of uh, text negotiation, but it's not a not a matter where where we have a have a major problem in a, in our approach or our philosophy. Let's say on on, on it. Um, yeah. Can I, but can I just uh, push you a bit on that? Where you say you'd like to have an element of civil society participation, does does that mean that you will, or that you're you're proposing to have it? It's a bit wishy-washy, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> you need to be wishy-washy to be a negotiator. So uh, <laughs> you need not to be wishy-washy to be a journalist. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> no, we we want to have that. That's very clear, and uh, this is the. Uh, this is the uh, the setup we we have in our our recent agreements. Uh, so uh, I mean, no questions about that. What about you, Ambassador? Is that a, a view you share? Um, is this something uh, the sustainable development part of the agreement? Uh, is that up there with uh, with the Canadian side as well? Do you think? Um, I was uh, heavily involved with the, uh, the the six negotiations that we've concluded uh, in the last three or four uh, years or five years while I was still in Ottawa. Uh, every one of them has a um, as a labor and environment uh, component, um, and uh, and I am confident, uh, as as Philippe said, that there will be a reflection of that uh, in in this text. Um, I, uh, it's, it's, it's not to say that it exactly has to mirror what we've done in the past, but I think the, 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 the concerns and the issues that are, have come up uh, on, on both sides uh, are being thrashed through in a way that can, can meet the particular needs. But uh, as I said, we have labor and environment uh, provisions and side agreements now. Our model is different and we're, you know, we're looking at, at, uh, at, at the best model in the context of CETA, uh, but the issues itself, uh, I don't think there's, uh, there's an agreement. Uh, just just before I, uh, as an aside, uh, picking up on the previous question, um, I, I would also note while the language is still being played, there's also a reference to the uh, uh, sustainable development even in the in the SPA uh, text that's being uh, being worked on. So there are cross references that are being made on on, our, on a number of issues. Okay, now while we're we're uh, walking delicately through minefields on this issue of provinces and uh, the role of. Uh, the federal and the provinces. Um, can you, um, Mr. Schultz was asking, um, can you give us any sense of any new developments there? I mean, as we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, um, this is an area, you know, where the, maybe more on the muni municipality level, there's been some issues. Um, Philippe mentioned as well, you're sort of straying into new territory politically for Canada. What can you give us in terms of uh, the latest on where you are on those things? Yeah, I. I I wouldn't say this is a minefield. 
uh, we um, have worked very closely with the provinces and the territories uh, from the moment this, uh, this process started, and all provinces and territories support an ambitious and comprehensive agreement. Uh, and uh, for the first time ever, they are uh, much more involved with the actual negotiations than they've ever been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the Council of Federation, which is where the provinces come together, um, uh, declared in 2009 at the beginning uh, of this whole process that they would implement all the obligations undertaken during the negotiation. Now, clearly, the, uh, the negotiations are still ongoing, so it's impossible to say exactly what is going to be relevant to, for, at the provincial and sub and sub uh, provincial level. Uh, but uh, as I said in my opening statement, uh, as recently as a few weeks ago, uh, the, there's a joint statement that's come out saying there's no more important uh, negotiating priority than the CETA. So we work very closely. My, my colleagues here from Quebec, uh, we, we talk, uh, they happen to be in, in Brussels with us. We talk on a regular basis and, uh, and it's, uh, we have a, a very well established cons consultative mechanism, not just on these negotiations, but on the other 14, you know, whatever negotiations that we're doing uh, around the world. Um, I'm mindful there's somebody else who wants to ask a question, but I know Mr. Schultz had a, another thing that he wanted to put to you, Philippe, which is uh, about the sort of linkage with uh, the EU-US uh, negotiations. Um, two parts to that question, really. One, as it relates to the rules of origin, but also in the sort of broader sense, how is this going to impact on the... Is that more or less right? Yeah. Yes, uh, on, the first, uh, on the first question, the, uh, this is precisely why we have uh, rules of origin. And the, rules are, the purpose of the rules of origin is to, um, let's say, to avoid that the third uh, country uses, uh, uses a preferential agreement uh, to which it hasn't undersigned. That's, that's the basic, basic principle. And what does it mean? It means that, that products have to fulfill uh, for example, conditions in terms of local added value or in terms of local transformation. Sometimes more specific rules or more specific products. But this is the, the, key, uh, the key element to it. It's to, be, uh, to have an assurance uh, that the, the product is essentially produced in the, uh, in the area or in the country, the region with whom you have the preferential agreement. That's why we have that, and uh, of course we live in a globalized economy, so there is global supply chains, so you cannot simply say 100% that exists for certain, for certain products, but what you want to have is that there's an essential part of the product which, uh, which has been created, let's say, in the, in the partner, uh, in the partner uh, country. And this is, this indeed, this is a, is a relevant factor in the context of the CETA negotiations because uh, Canada is, is very much interlinked with, uh, with the United States, indeed. But, uh, you know, we have our set of rules of origin, which tries to take, take this uh, to, into consideration. You, you want to follow up on this one, yeah? Mm? yeah. Uh, that I know. The problem is, or not the problem, the yeah. question is, have you found a, a compromise? Because we have different interpretations of the rules of origin in Canada and in the well, European Union. So that means. Well, so that might partly answer your we are still in the middle of it. Now, if you look at this, at, at this telephone book, there's a good part that we have solved. You know, sometimes because we simply have, have said, okay, this is not economic, you know, economically not, not relevant or not sensitive, so you know, it's, it's easy to, to, to play with the rule of the, of the other. But there are a set of, of products or product groups where this is very complex and where we still, we are still negotiating. That's why I said we, it's, a, it's a long process, yeah? and it's difficult, and there are no easy solutions to, to that. So uh, it needs a lot of creativity, and in the end of the day, it will need, from both sides, also a certain, certain uh, pragmatism and flexibility. Otherwise, we, uh, we will not be able to, to do that. Is that uh, okay? Uh, regarding your second question uh, with the, uh, concerning our uh, future with the United States, um, you know that uh, the EU-US summit last year put into operation or created this high-level working group uh, to study all, all options for uh, um, enhancing the economic relationship with the United States uh, in view of jobs and growth. 
Now, this high-level working group has rendered an interim report last week, has been uh, sent also to the Parliament. Uh, it has been um, published. I think Commissioner de Gucht comes as well to the Parliament to, to talk about that. Um, if you look at this report, you will see that there's now convergence uh, with the United States towards um, um, negotiation of a comprehensive FTA. The convergence. It's not a decision yet, not a recommendation. But let's say where we stand for the moment at, uh, at the time of this, this interim report is that, that the mines go in this direction. Now, we still have to, to work on the final report, so there's still a lot of of, of uh, substance that we need to, to look at and to build on. But where we stand currently, uh, let's say the, the, the common, common uh, perception is that if we, if we move into, into a new type of relationship, then a comprehensive uh, FDA might be, might be the, the best one in terms of generating uh, jobs and growth. Um, so there's work to do. Then uh, the final report may bring in or bring out a recommendation whatever it is, and then on the basis of this uh, recommendation, of course, the, the decisions will be taken uh, in, the normal institutional, uh, in the normal institutional process. Um, but it's clear that uh, when we, when we uh, now look into our Canada negotiation, we also look, of course, how does this, uh, could this impact later on uh, if, if we had a negotiation with the United States. Ambassador, would you, you wanted to make a point. Uh, yeah, just bridging these, these two points, I guess. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that an ambitious uh, market access uh, outcome, which we both are striving for, uh, is it's not just about tariffs. Uh, it is. It is certainly about uh, rules of origin, which are which are critical to this. And as Philippe said, in our case, they they need to take into account the fact that we are in an, in an integrated North American market. Um, but also, uh, we need to ensure that we develop mechanisms that also address other non-tariff me uh, measures, because there's no point for either side in addressing sort of all but the issue that's that's keeping the product or the service from moving forward. So. You have to look at, at each of these issues, whether it's goods, services, investment, as to what is your objective and what are the components that need to be addressed to improve uh, the, um, uh, the area, um, uh, improve the, the, the bilateral access in, in, in both directions. In terms of the transatlantic, we're obviously uh, keeping a, an eye on, on how those, uh, that process is, is unfolding, given the interest we have on, in both markets. Uh, from a trade policy perspective, I would also note that many of the issues that you're dealing with us, if you ever do get into a negotiation with the, Europe, uh, the Americans, you're going to run into the same ones. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so some of the innovative and creative solutions that we're looking for here might actually be useful not just for us in other negotiations, but other negotiations that Europe may uh, want to get involved with, including, dare I say, the SPA. Uh, before we invite our next panel up, uh, let me just let this gentleman who's been sitting here patiently uh, make his point or ask his question. I hope you're okay to stay another minute or two. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Adelaide Ferrand from the um, International Fund for Animal Welfare, I4. Ah, we were wondering when you were going to ask a well, question. Well, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> and I have a question for Ambassador Plunkett. Uh, first of all, let me thank all the speakers um, for this very interesting uh, overview of, of these negotiations. Um, as an external observer, I4, as well as other civil society organizations, um, has watched with some concern what seems to be a growing gap between the EU and Canada on biodiversity issues and the environment in general. And um, as you already mentioned, Mr. Ambassador, there is, of course, the tar sands issue, uh, which is part of, of, of those negotiations uh, in the energy chapter. Um, there is also uh, Canada's withdrawal from the Kyoto Protocol Agreement last December. Um, and one issue, which, of course, you didn't mention, is not part of the negotiation, but it's um, Canada's complaint against the EU seal regime in the World Trade Organization. Uh, which, in our view, is part of this growing gap between the EU and Canada on, on um, biodiversity issues. Uh, my question 
is the following. How are you trying to address this, uh, what seems to be a, a growing gap between those two key partners, which are the EU and Canada? And don't you think that in the context of these negotiations, uh, as you said, concessions have to be made? Wouldn't a gesture of goodwill on some of these issues, uh, such as dropping the complaint in the WTO, might actually help bridge that gap? Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, Ambassador, if I might say, don't, uh, and you might not like me for this, feel you've, we've got to get into the detail of the, the SEAL dispute, because, uh, but, but I think the, the question is valid. Uh, in the context of these negotiations, uh, given that they're maybe not going as fast as you would like them to, would this be, is there actually an interplay here? And some of the issues are indirectly related, some are less uh, related. And then I'll ask Philippe also to comment about whether or not uh, these issues actually are affecting uh, the negotiations or could, uh, could play into them in any way. Um, uh, thank you for your question. I, uh, I, was, I was forewarned to, that uh, something like this might be coming, so I have my pages ready. Um, as, I, as I said in my, uh, in my opening comments, uh, friends, even best friends, can disagree on, on some particular files. Uh, and, uh, and, and let me deal with the seal right up front. Uh, this is an issue, a long-standing issue, where we have uh, a disagreement about. Um, and uh, we have uh, initiated a WTO challenge, uh, to, uh, which is exactly what the WTO dispute settlement procedures are, are used for, in the same way that the Europeans over the, you know, have not stopped using dispute settlement procedures uh, on issues of concern to them. Uh, so we do not consider it uh, a, 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 an issue that somebody uses a mechanism that is, is negotiated in advance to deal exactly with the sort of concerns that are being raised here. And we'll just see uh, how it plays out. You know, for the record, I will, you know, say that we continue to be committed to defending the legitimate economic activity that our that our uh, that our sealing industry is involved with, uh, and the coastal and 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 uh, and uh, northern communities that depend on it. But that's well rehearsed. Both sides know the arguments, and now we'll we'll go to the WTO and see and see what uh, what plays out. On terms of the other issues, I, I mentioned the fuel quality issue uh, in uh, in uh, in my uh, comments. And while my expert is sitting over there and and would want me to go on at great length in explaining all of the discriminatory measures which we can identify, I'll I'll, I'll take the chair's uh, uh, comments to heart and, and spare uh, her that, but also to say we are working with our European friends uh, to address uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, on a number of fronts. While we, while we may not agree always on exactly how uh, people are going about it, whether it's the aviation issue or the, or the uh, fuel quality, we are we are uh, certainly uh, agreeing uh, to the the objective uh, the overall objective of this, and we are working both on our own measures and internationally to uh, to address them. We uh, made it very clear uh, early on. This government um, has made it very clear that it was it did not think that the Kyoto uh, Protocol uh, was was uh, was a viable uh, instrument because it did not cover uh, the world's two largest uh, emitters, China and the United States, who happens to be our biggest economic partner. So it's a, it's um, and 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 it, as well, it doesn't deal with the most rapidly growing source of emissions elsewhere in the world. That said, we are working, you know, in, the, in coming out of the Durban uh, meeting, we are working with our European friends. We support the leadership role that they took uh, in Durban, and we will continue to work with the EU and other partners to address uh, some of the issues which I think lie behind uh, your question. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Philippe, can I ask you right, not to particularly go into the SEALs and the, and the Kyoto arguments, but in those areas that regard uh, tar sands and fuel quality, um, and given that you've said that you are, um, there is a sustainability chapter, I suppose they are the issues which indirectly could be in some way affected or linked. Could you say whether you think they are? It does this tie the hands of the EU to regulate in those kind of areas in any way? What is their relevance to this trade agreement, actually? 
Um, I mean, both issues are, of course, uh, you know, important issues on their own on, on their own merit, um, but they are not trade issues, um, and therefore um, we don't uh, and we don't want to see them as as part of the trade negotiation. I mean, they're specific issues. A sustainability chapter gives uh, you know a general framework, uh, but but these are specific issues. I mean, uh, fuel quality directive is not not. Not the competence of, of GG Trade, nor nor is 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 the seals issue. I mean, uh, Canada has used uh, its its uh, its right to invoke the WTO dispute settlement. It's its good right, and we will use our right to defend our regulation on this. But it's something which which goes uh, aside from the from the trade negotiation proper, and uh, we there will not be a specific uh, you know. Uh, I mean. F the Fuel Holder Directive is about our internal regulation uh, on, uh, you know, uh, on, on, on emissions. So it has nothing to do per se, uh, or is not subject to a bilateral agreement, even if, of course, our, our regulation could potentially have an effect as well on, 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 on trade relations. But it's not, not something to be regulated in a, in a, in a trade agreement. Uh, so. Um, I don't. I don't see, uh, you know, that this uh, this really uh, uh, comes directly in. But I repeat, it's two important issues, which uh, in the in the relationship between the EU and Canada, which needs to be uh, needs to be. And in the end, you don't see these issues impeding negotiations in any way. Not from our end, no. Okay. Well, on that note, uh, thank you uh, very much, all of you. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Philippe, from the Commission, and uh, Joe as well. Um, I think it, it, it be, it's, it's sort of timely now to get a little bit more into the detail of what this agreement is going to look like, uh, who it's going to benefit, who it might be worrying um, as well. Uh, so, um, gentlemen, thanks very much. Thank you, all of you. Let's say thanks to... Uh, our panel and for that very uh, very helpful insight actually into what's going on um, and uh, perhaps I could invite um, my next victims up to the panel please <laughs> uh, to come and join us um, Jason uh, Langrish and Arnaud Petit and Louis Nicolas Forta I think you'll have you've you will have some name tags, so you know where to go. Um, Here's my name. Come and sit here. And, oh, you've got your name. Yeah, yes. yeah. Do-it-yourself panel today. <laughs> so uh, I'll introduce you already so we can get on with uh, our discussions. To um, On my right is uh, Jason Langrish, who you'll be hearing from first of all. Um, uh, Jason is the executive director of the Canada-Europe Roundtable for Business, which, as the name suggests, um, will uh, you have a pretty good perspective on the business side of things, both from Canada and uh, from the European side. But you're currently based in Canada, aren't you? Yes. So that, that's nice that you can give us that uh, perspective. Um, on my left is uh, Arnaud Petit, who is from the um, organization that represents uh, farming uh, groups in Europe, COPPA. Kogeka. I don't know why I always find, find that uh, hard to pronounce, but anyway, thank you for joining us. And of course, as we heard, one of the issues, one of the sticking points is currently on agricultural issues, so perhaps you can give us a bit of a European perspective on that. Uh, and uh, also, um, the, other, the, the other issue that we've mentioned is uh, pharmaceuticals, and um, Louis-Nicolas Fortin um, from that sort of umbrella organization as well that represents the European industry. Uh, can talk to us about that and perhaps the kind of, um, I don't know if tension is too strong a word, but anyway, it's perhaps the slightly different interests um, between the generic uh, industry in Canada and your own uh, and what you want out of the agreement. So, uh, Jason, can you give us a sense now, um, uh, an overview really, a perspective on uh, where you think uh, the benefits, uh, what, what people want out of this agreement really on the two business sides? Sure. Um, thank you uh, very much it's, uh, for putting this together. It's nice to be here. Uh, we're spending an increasing amount of time in the Parliament, which is an indication that we are getting close to the finish line at the uh, outset of this agreement. It was really a lot of work with member states and uh, with the European Commission. Uh, one thing, I noticed Philippe was hesitant to give you a date uh, as to when the negotiations would conclude. Um, I'd be happy to give you a date. 
and I'd put them on at uh, October of 2012. Now, I don't know how happy he's going to be about hearing that, but that's, that's, that's the date that gets bandied about by our trade minister in Canada, and I, I think uh, the trade commissioner shares the sentiment that they'd like to conclude negotiations by that time. Now, of course, uh, negotiations are very detailed, um, arduous at times, uh, things to uh, conclude. And so it wouldn't be surprising if uh, there was uh, a delay, but that is uh, hopeful. We're hopeful that that, would, it, that it will be concluded this year. Uh, just a little bit of Trade 101 is the reason why companies in the first place want these FTAs. Um, Companies orientate towards FTAs. Uh, contrary to popular belief, it's not a race to the bottom. Uh, companies don't go to lesser developed uh, countries um, to take advantage of lower environmental standards and labor rights. Uh, surely there's been instances of that occurring, but um, generally speaking, the kind of jobs that migrate to these regions are the ones that um, advanced economies really don't want to do anymore. And uh, really what companies look for increasingly is access to skilled labor, infrastructure, uh, access to capital markets and rule of the law. And uh, I think that there's all kinds of examples of how this plays out. One only needs to really look at the uh, flows of foreign direct investment into economies to realize that the lion's share still goes into advanced economies for pre uh, precisely the reasons I've mentioned. Uh, also, with regards to manufacturing, which gets a lot of talk when it comes to trade agreements, uh, it is declining as a percentage of the workforce and you know every advanced economy every every time I'm in uh, and I hear a debate It's always the same. Why is manufacturing shrinking? Why are these jobs going away? It's happening everywhere. It's uh, it's shrinking too. if you have 15% of your um, labor force is employed in in manufacturing, you can count yourself lucky nowadays. And this is uh, due to a variety of factors, but, uh, but it's largely due to mechanization. And uh, you could say the same of agriculture, forestry, fishing, all kinds of other industries. So the question is, what's picking up the slack? What's picking up the slack is services. Services trade accounts for about 75% of our economies. Uh, it's interesting, though, we still tend to talk a lot about industry. It's still important. In fact, even the, uh, the theme of the event here is what's in it for industry. Uh, there is certainly things in these agreements for industry, but there's a lot in it for people who provide services as well. And uh, the reason why these sort of new generation of trade agreements is so important is because in traditional trade agreements, a lot of these services are not bound by these trade agreements. In fact, a lot of the services that exist today were not even invented and, and uh, uh, prevalent at the time when these uh, agreements were negotiated. So we have a new generation where we're now increasingly going behind the border. And uh, what's driving this is global supply chains, which um, basically snake all over the globe. Uh, you know, um, the automobile that you drove here to the conference in or what have you, I mean, it, it's probably been assembled. Um, it's uh, the constituent parts, the automobile, come from several different countries. It's been assembled in a variety of different places, and uh, thus the difficulty with regards to the rules of origin issues. But the FTAs are certainly different nowadays. Um, with regards to the private sector views, in Canada's case, uh, the move to diversify has sort of been a, it's been a luxury. I mean, it's, uh, there's been a lot of low-hanging fruit for the country. It's uh, had the NAFTA market, which has been very good for it. When the U.S. was growing at 5%, uh, whatever Canada could, uh, could make or uh, supply in terms of services or, or resources or what have you was either um, uh, used in the domestic market or was used within NAFTA market. It's not really the case anymore. Uh, so this weakened export market is, uh, and also problems uh, with regards to Canadian um, exporters notably getting caught up in a U.S. political agenda, has led a, a, a very aggressive push for diversification. Uh, Europe was uh, basically the first uh, region that came up, um, you know, it's always the, the go-to place is always the United States for Canada, but Europe uh, solidly came onto the radar about four years ago. And, um, you know, while there are some groups that still oppose the CETA, they oppose various, uh, various um, other agreements such as, you know, auto workers and um, some protected industries and things like that, generally speaking, uh, the, broad, the population and industry and uh, the service providers are, are quite supportive. Uh, with regards to the European Union and uh, the European uh, companies, what we've seen increasingly is uh, they're very good. Uh, the, the European multinationals are, um, are very good on the international stage. They perform very well. And uh, they 
they've run into a bit of a barrier. The internal market's just not providing the growth prospects that it uh, was once uh, that it once did, and so this uh, seems to be pushing, uh, 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 leading to a very strong push for FTAs as well. And there seems to be, uh, as far as I can tell, there, there's often this sort of holy trinity of issues when it comes to the European Union and their free trade agreements. And what it is, uh, open procurement is, is always a big issue. Uh, strong intellectual property protections, including the concept of geographic indications, which are not, um, really don't really exist outside of the European Union, although they are um, slowly using the trade agreements to spread them out. And uh, that's been, um, you know, it, it seems to have had some effect uh, till now. And of course, uh, market access for key goods and services. Uh, why this agreement uh, is important to industry, uh, certainly from the European side, is this is the first time that there's going to be a really comprehensive investment and services negotiation with the European Union. And that's very important. Um, I think it's, uh, it's an issue that sometimes gets, uh, it's not recognized. I mean, this is sort of post uh, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, this, this competency, notably for investment, has migrated to Brussels. There's been some back and forth, it seems, with regards to what exactly this negotiating mandate is. But I think it was a vote of confidence that it was uh, decided uh, within the European Council and essentially within the European Union that it would be Canada that would be the test case. And so that speaks to the depth of the relationship and the importance of the relationship. Uh, I'm not sure that this would have been possible with other trading uh, partners uh, from the European context. Uh, we've, uh, as a group, we've existed since 1999. We're supported by over 100 chief executive officers of Canadian and European companies. Uh, the push did start on the Canadian side, and uh, notably with Quebec. Um, that was uh, both from an industry and a political perspective. Notably, the Premier of Quebec, Jean Charest, got really behind this agreement. Uh, but it's since broadened. And with regards to Canada, if you're looking at the sectors that are really sort of interested in this agreement, you'd be looking at things like forestry, um, non-supply managed agriculture, so grains, beef, pork, pulses, those types of things, certainly manufacturing. Uh, processed foods, just uh, by way, just uh, the Toronto area has the second largest food processing industry in North America, only behind Los Angeles. I think it employs something like 200,000 people. So there is a big processed foods industry, uh, resources and infrastructure, and of course services. You're always going to hear services with advanced economies. With regards to the EU, we see uh, transit, um, public transit, infrastructure, manufacturing, of course services. Uh, foodstuffs, um, IP. IP is a really big one. I think that the, it's much more weighted towards um, the EU in terms of its interests than it is Canada. But Canada is coming around to realizing that its intellectual property protections are outdated and it needs to upgrade them. Um, given how uh, business lines are structured, going back to my comments about supply chains, with these agreements, what really matters, it's the sum of all the improvements. Um, you know, in the old, uh, old free trade agreements, you'd have these very large tariff lines um, or tariff peaks in some cases. And that was the primary goal, was to get rid of these things and so uh, provide market access for exporters. Uh, now it's it's really a, it's a, it's many s different things. It's the ability to relocate your workers in a timely fashion. It's access to capital markets. It's uh, technical barriers to trade. It's the avoidance of technical barriers to trade, notably when they're based when they're not based on sound science. So it's those types of things that increasingly matter. Um, so th this, you know, when thinking about trade, um, you really have to think about trade and investment, and arguably the, in the investment is, is really the horse that leads the cart, which is trade. So uh, thus the change in the nature of agreements. Uh, just to, I'm just going to conclude with just some brief remarks in terms of these agreements within the overall trade agendas of the, the two regions. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's some industries in Canada that probably don't much care about the CETA. Uh, but they, uh, in terms of the actual benefits that it will bring, and the same point could be said for the European Union. But really what's, uh, what's important is not just the benefits in terms of bilateral commercial liberalization that the agreement will, be, will bring, but it's also the domestic reforms that these trade agreements facilitate. It's a lot easy, uh, say let's take the case of there's a lot of talk right now about reforming the supply management system in Canada, which is a, it's a quota system for the production of uh, dairy products. 
you know, if we were to do that unilaterally within Canada, it would be politically a very difficult thing to do. But if you say we're doing it because we're going to get access to this very large market, which is the European Union or the Asian market or whatever the case may be, it becomes a lot easier to sell. So that's one of the things that's happening. Also within Canada, the CETA is increasingly recognized as being a foundational agreement. It's an agreement that needs to get passed so that Canada can also move forward with the other aspects of its trade agenda, which include the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and also uh, Japan would be another one. And uh, we're hearing soundings that China might be on the list as well, although that's not been announced. Um, also, movement on some of these issues like intellectual property will greatly assist Canadian relations with the United States. These are out, like long-standing sticking points. With regards to the EU, uh, the, I, uh, clearly the European Union uh, and its uh, businesses are very interested in the Canadian market. However, it's not terribly large when compared to the American market, and thus we've heard soundings that there's a push now for uh, a EU-US free trade deal. I would hope it would be an EU-NAFTA free trade deal. Uh, and if it were to be that, what would be nice about that type of initiative is it would allow us to clean up a lot of the um, rules of origin issues that Philippe was referring to, which. Uh, uh, in a lot of cases, Canadian production is heavily integrated with the United States and makes it difficult to sometimes find technical ways in which to qualify products for access to the European Union. So overall, um, you know, business is uh, fairly resolute in their support for this agreement. We believe that it's going to be a very ambitious and comprehensive agreement, and we look forward to it concluding shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. It, it seems from what you're saying that... Um for the Canadian side, the kind of business and economic benefits are very clear and perhaps more than for the EU. Um, and the EU is kind of as much a political and, uh, you know, you, you used the phrase test case. I noticed some smiles from over yeah. there on that. Um, is that true? I mean, given that it was the Canadians who were pushing for this to start with. Does the EU well, stand to benefit as much as Canada does? Well, well, clearly in terms of absolute value, there's a category of market which is the United States, China, Brazil, and, and European Union, which is much more populous. But in terms of uh, dollar value gain, um, the European Union will clearly do better. As a percentage of their GDP, it will not do as well. So I think you could make that case, but I wouldn't take it too far. I think that... Uh, the benefits to European industry are fairly evident, notably with regards to in certain areas like um, public procurement, intellectual property. They need these things so that they can make greater investments into the Canadian marketplace, which is a growing marketplace, mm -hmm. not just in terms of its GDP, but also its population. Mm -hmm. And as we were hearing from the previous speakers, this is as much about investment as, uh, as trade. Now, um, Arnaud, we, um, we heard uh, briefly, Jason mentioned uh, some of the issues actually that are featuring in these negotiations. Uh, from your point of view, for the farmers, um, there is a reason, isn't there, that agriculture is one of the, uh, the sticking points. Um, presumably, you uh, spend quite a lot of your time lobbying uh, these people uh, involved in these, uh, I don't know whether you've ever met before, anyway, I won't start grilling you about what, how many lunches you took Philippe uh, on last week, but, but where are the sticking points on, the, uh, on, on this from your side? What are the farmers concerned about? Where might they actually benefit from this? Uh, and where, is your, where do you want the negotiators to go, actually, talking about compromise earlier, uh, where should those compromises, I mean, I know you're in negotiation, but if you can see some room for compromise, where will that be, do you think? Thank you very much. And I would like to thank also MEPs, like Marine and Lyon, indeed, to organize this event and to include uh, the, the issue of agriculture. Uh, because going in the detail, it's always looking for the devil. So um, I would say, first of all, I would like just to keep a context and just to remind you what does it mean, Copan Kujekan, to make sure. easy your, your life. I would say, mention European farmers and agri crops. It would be more easier for you than to, to mention the, 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 our brand, is it indeed? Okay. We are representing, second slide, 30 million of farmers and their families and around 40,000 agri crops and uh, joining 
uh, more, uh, next slide, more than uh, 70 national professional farmers organizations and agri groups from the 27 member states. And I would like to remind here, indeed, we have a close contact with the Canadian uh, organization since a long time. Um, since 1967, indeed, we are organizing a joint workshop with the North American uh, Farmers Organization to exchange our point of view on uh, agricultural policy, but also international aspects. So, indeed, we have already a close contact, and we see this negotiation as an issue to increase our uh, common interest rather than, I would say, to, set, to settle new dispute between farmers. That's, I think, it's very important in this context to, to get this objective uh, at the end. And uh, also the next slides, please. I would like to, to say also that Canadian and also European uh, um, Union get also an agricultural policy, a long story in agricultural policy. So there, indeed, the main challenge for us is how to get uh, a trade agreement and keep at the same time this agricultural policy in place. So uh, in terms of trade between EU and Canada, as you see, as you may see in the graph, indeed, we have more or less already a balanced uh, trade in agri, in agri food sector. It's slightly uh, positive for, for you, around 500 million euros. And if you look in details about what EU is exporting, is mainly processed product. So this is why the issue for European farmers, I would say, is not uh, focus on raw materials, but it's an agri-food chain. And there it's very different uh, with the negotiation we are uh, uh, doing in Mercosur. In Mercosur, we, we have direct uh, competition between farmers. Here, it, indeed, the competition is on the agri-food chain. That's, I think it's very important to, to take on board. So the next slide, please. Uh, and for Canadian import, it's more linked to uh, raw material. Uh, if I go in sectorial issues, uh, first of all, the sectoral sector, there is this proposal to liberalize the cereal sector and specifically for feed wheat. Um, for the farmers European farmers' perspective, I, we consider it as a very important step forward uh, for, Europe, for Europe indeed, because there is a competitiveness from the, the, from the Canadian sector in, in this specific production. Uh, further, indeed, we are paying twice the abolition of this public statute of wheat board, because you know in WTO, indeed, we had already an agreement of abolishing restitution of export refund if the other uh, partners of WTO are, uh, would say are also dismantling the other type of support to export. So this is why I would say this is already a big offer uh, for, um, uh, from EU. On durum rate also, uh, we are importing a lot of durum rate from Canada and there there is a real risk of outsourcing of the industrial production from from, from, I would say, from pasta. So this is why, the, uh, at the end, for European farmers, we can lose, I would say, our outlet in, in the Durham rate. On the dairy sector, for, for us, we, cl we clearly see as a very offensive interest uh, from uh, for the farming uh, perspective, farmers' pe perspective. And I would say here the main hurdle to, in, in terms of trade to, to Canada is the sanitary issues uh, imposed by the Canadian authorities. So and. It has been mentioned a long time in this relationship to NAFTA on this specific sector. It's not linked to NAFTA. So that means indeed there, this is purely a negotiation between EU and Canada. And this is why we think uh, we should go forward on this aspect. And furthermore, um, in EU, if I put in Canada, but in relation of the abolition of quota regime, in EU, it has been already decided. So there, indeed, we are already in a uh, in very uh, market-oriented approach. So this is why we... I think we have a very good uh, uh, offensive interest on this uh, dairy sector, meaning cheese e export uh, mainly. Eh? On pig meat and poultry sector, um, Canada has a supply management system in place. They want to, to keep it, and we may understand due, due to the uh, proximity to US market also. So this is why we, we understand that, and th that's right also. They have, they have a very competitive uh, industry there. So this is why this is a sensitive issue, and in that aspect, as long as the supply management would be in place in Canada, yes, for sure, we have to protect also our market. Uh, on wine sector, uh, you know there, there is a specific agreement on wine, but we think we should improve the implementation because there is there are some margin of maneuver with the province, as it has been mentioned uh, 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 earlier, and here indeed, I, as I would say, it's not really part of the negotiation, but the correct implementation should be a good uh, willing from the Canadians' uh, part to, to express, to implement a, a real free trade agreement. Uh, next slide on uh, horizontal issues. 
Uh, it has already mentioned the intellectual property, and for the farming sector, this is a geographical in, uh, in identification, indication or identification. It is a good step forward, I would say, from the Canadian part to recognize uh, the system, the European system. I think it's the first time from the North American country we have a positive, sin a positive signal on it, and it should be raised this year as a very uh, good movement forward. Uh, the only one thing we, we would like to see is indeed the list should not be closed, indeed, because now the issue is closed list and for new uh, ge geographical indication, we should have a new negotiation and that's something probably very complicated. Uh, rule of origins also for agriculture is quite important uh, on two issues I would like to mention. First of all, uh, issue of sugar. Uh, there is a uh, very uh, competitive sugar industry in Canada, and you know in Canada is importing 90% of the sugar is processing in its, in its uh, territory. So there, indeed, uh, we have an issue of tri uh, triangular trade between uh, Canada and other countries and going to EU. So this is why the rule of origin is very important, and we would like to, to see, to stick, I would say, on the strict uh, rules of origin, and also for the bovine sector species. And bovine sector is quite important also, and you know this uh, uh, OE um, rules, meaning uh, traceability, not more than 90 days before the slaughtering. And here, indeed, we would like to have an extend uh, approach of the traceability. In EU, it's from the, the animal born to the end of the life of this animal. So here, we have to improve the traceability to avoid also this uh, triangular trade. Finally, as it has been also mentioned, and I would like also to pinpoint, there is an interlink with the current discussion with US. And believe me, um, with the relation we have with the US farmers organization also. They are really looking what's happened in this EU-Canada negotiation, and for them it will be the red line. So what we will not achieve in the EU-Canada negotiation, we will not achieve with US after a while. So this is why it's very important, I would say, to keep in mind these two negotiations, and I would say after, after this EU-Canada negotiation, we will not match further uh, a concession from uh, our US uh, counterpart. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, very detailed, but actually very clear, even for me, and I'm not a specialist in these issues, so that's good. Um, and uh, I'm not going to dwell too long. Perhaps there we'll have a bit of time for questions, but let me um, ask uh, Nicolas, uh, Louis-Nicolas Fortin to give us a, a perspective from the pharmaceuticals industry, which, of course, is another one which has got a particular... Uh, view on how things are going, and perhaps ask you as well to run us through some of those issues that are important for you in these talks. Certainly. Thank you, Shirin. Uh, honorable uh, members of Parliament, uh, Mr. Ambassadors, um, first of all, let me thank uh, Mr. Mrs. Kokmerin uh, for inviting us and gathering such a large uh, participation. Uh, to address uh, the interest and the value of the CETA negotiations uh, from the perspective of the research-based pharmaceutical industry. Um, and I will take uh, a few minutes to uh, give you the perspective, really, uh, of uh, our industry in promoting the relations between EU and Canada, and also uh, the broader context of the EU external trade agenda. Um, a word about FPA, we represent um, 30 uh, companies who are operating in research, uh, development and manufacturing in Europe. Uh, actually, a number of the CEOs of those companies were meeting yesterday evening in this house um, and reiterated their commitment to Europe in terms of promoting innovation and finding ways uh, also and policy uh, approaches uh, to stimulate uh, European growth. And so we were mentioning it's a challenge for everybody. And uh, the industry is taking up uh, that challenge as well with uh, the EU uh, Commission. Uh, so we um, are also representing uh, the national associations and uh, overall uh, more than 2,000 uh, companies operating in Europe. I uh, use a few graphic representations, first to keep your attention, as I'm the last speaker and it's always a challenge, um, and also to illustrate um, the importance of the research-based industry uh, in uh, uh, innovative medicines, uh, uh, preventive healthcare um, for Europe. Uh, actually, we are uh, the foremost uh, sector uh, investing in Europe uh, in high technology. Uh, as represented here. 
Um, next slide, please. Uh, also, we, it's uh, uh, notable uh, that we um, employ uh, over 600,000 uh, people, including uh, over 100,000 specialized uh, in research and development uh, throughout Europe, uh, and indirectly three to four times uh, more uh, jobs uh, throughout Europe. Next slide, please. Uh, but one aspect uh, that we have been focusing upon is also uh, the strength of our industry towards the world in terms of external trade, of making those uh, innovative medicines available throughout uh, populations uh, throughout the world. Um, and we are um, significantly uh, uh, one of the sectors who are bringing a positive trade balance for Europe. Uh, without further ado, I will turn to uh, the subject uh, matter of today. Um, next slide, please. Um, and um, um, focus a little bit on our external trade agenda and uh, which uh, ranges between emerging markets, obviously, who are more and more uh, competitive, um, in, including in our sector uh, in pharmaceuticals, uh, but where we find uh, some opportunities, but also in strengthening uh, these relations and this joint agenda uh, between a more mature market, uh, long-standing partners, including uh, Canada. Um, and that is both uh, to increase market access, as uh, the previous panel and, and uh, my co-speakers uh, have mentioned, but also to elevate the standards uh, in terms of the trade agenda overall. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Turning to the pharmaceutical uh, market and the, the, the interaction between EU and Canada, um, actually our industry has been very present, very committed also towards Canada. Uh, significant investments uh, were made, um, over one billion a year. Um, however, it's a relatively low proportion of the investments throughout the world, so there is opportunity to improve. Um, these contribute to uh, and the, the uh, provision of medicines in, uh, um, will contribute also and, and already contribute to improving the healthcare system uh, in Canada. Um, we are actually sharing a very similar approach to healthcare and I believe to, to uh, this uh, um, uh, social uh, system. Uh, so we have similarities, uh, there. The, the environment in some ways uh, we can draw parallels definitely. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, through the CETA we can address uh, some of maybe the discrepancies that remain. Um, so I won't uh, dwell further on the, this um, aspect. Um, one of the main priorities for our sector is uh, to, as I mentioned, um, elevate or review some of the IP standards in Canada. Um, Shirin, you did mention uh, in the introduction of the panel uh, the question about uh, the viewpoint of Canadian industry versus European industry in the negotiations. I would say that in fact uh, we worked very much hand in hand with many of uh, the industries uh, operating in Canada, uh, from Canada. Um, actually, we meet in terms of uh, uh, seeking improvements to uh, some of the IP regime uh, pertaining specifically to pharmaceuticals. Um, so, for instance, and uh, bear with me just a second because they are very technical and I will try to do as best as uh, my uh, colleague from agriculture sector in uh, just uh, giving you a glance at, uh, at what are the challenges in operating in Canada. First of all, there is a, an issue that we have been facing and that was recognized, I believe, by our European uh, colleagues and uh, authorities as a truly uh, a fundamental, uh, um, let's say, correction or, or issue to address in Canada is uh, ensuring a right of appeal in what is, uh, if you wish, uh, the administrative decision-making process. Uh, whenever there are challenges around the patent validity. I leave it at that, uh, but we consider it's very fundamental. I believe it's recognized in Canada as well as, as a challenge, has been over the years. 
um, but there is still a solution to be found domestically. Um, also, uh, we are here looking at really trying to partner and, and enhance the, the uh, industrial policy to promote innovation. And here, it's uh, the European Union has introduced some mechanisms over the years. The European Parliament has supported those, uh, including, uh, I start from the bottom, regulatory data protection, uh, which is a protection that is awarded uh, in return for developing extensively over 10 years in general, uh, and at a lot of cost, uh, the data that is required by the medicines agencies. Uh, both uh, also in Canada as well. Huh? So, um, but in Canada, the, the mechanism, and I will illustrate it uh, more succinctly in the last slide, um, there is a, a discrepancy. Also, there was a reference uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Dupuis to uh, the patent protection. There is a recognition that for pharmaceutical industry, there's a challenge. Uh, actually, we cannot uh, uh, protect uh, discovery uh, and innovation and launch it to the market as rapidly as other sectors. It takes, uh, in, in average, about 10 years, 12 years sometimes to have uh, also the registration. So there are many years uh, where actually the patent has no actual value for, for investors. And in that case, uh, the EU and many other countries have introduced mechanisms to compensate that. Uh, but Canada does not have such uh, a mechanism at all. Uh, so I conclude with a, a last slide um, that tries to capture <laughs> those three issues in a more uh, uh, palatable way. Uh, but actually, um, so to, to you know, answer the, the objective of today's uh, uh, event, uh, we see the, the Canada CETA as a, as a way to address those uh, very specific uh, objectives of uh, both European but also mm -hmm. Canadian uh, research-based industry. And uh, looking also ahead at uh, other uh, trade agreement negotiations uh, where maybe Canada and the EU can, uh, can partner or at least seek uh, similar standards. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, that seems to echo something you were suggesting, Jason, that there was a, uh, and, and, and you put that across, that this was um, a chance potentially that Canadian business as well, uh, research-based business, uh, to reform the current system. Uh, that this, these, these agreement, this agreement uh, was an opportunity to actually have reform, which has been quite hard to get domestically. Uh, is that the sense that is that the sense that you get of what's going on, uh, particularly in this sector? Uh, yeah, absolutely. But you know, again, any meaningful, uh, comprehensive trade and economic agreement or investment agreement will do that. Mm -hmm. That will be a condition of the implementation of the agreement because. How can it be comprehensive if you're not making some sort of adjustment on either side? In the case of the European Union, they'll have to make adjustments with regards to temporary workers, uh, or uh, sorry, not temporary workers, but uh, uh, temporary placements of workers who work for Posted large companies. Workers, yeah, there's a term for it. It's, uh, anyways, we know things of mean. those things of those na uh, things mm -hmm. of that nature, and also the services list as well. So this is another. This would be another one. Thank you very much uh, to, to all of you for giving us that, that, us that perspective. Now, before I hand over to George Lyon, uh, who, of course, uh, is, has been uh, co-hosting this event, uh, is there anyone uh, who's bursting to ask a question? Uh, and yes, good. Uh, we, we are going to hear from the, the report author of the parliaments at time. Is that you? Do you want to ask a question? Oh, OK, fine. Um, the gentleman there, the lady there, and then we're going to wrap up. So um, please give us uh, where you're from. <coughs> Rolf Müller, International Policy Council on Agriculture and Food Trade. Yes. I have one specific question on the regulatory differences. That is uh, genetically modified organisms. Mm -hmm. And my next question goes to Jason and to Arno. Should this be included in the agreement? And if yes, in what way? Thank you. Okay, just before you answer that, Jason, let me hear from the lady there. Yes. Je suis Stella Velike. Je suis physicien informaticien.
Stella Physique. I'm a New European citizen, a physicist, and a computer scientist. And I have a question on the Canadian immigration policy. I've heard there's controlled immigration policy, and I wanted to know how that works. Uh, because in Europe, we don't, we don't really have it. How, how does our immigration policy work between the countries of the European Union and Canada? The second question. Canada as uh, is is commercial partner is China and we are faced with uh, a lot of problems of uh, counterfeit Chinese products and low quality Chinese products. Do you have the same problem in Canada? And what have you done about it? If you'll forgive me, I think the 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 questions about immigration policy are slightly off the. Uh, agenda of these particular speakers. So I'm going to, if, if that wants to be brought up uh, at the end, uh, in terms, I know that the whole visa issue is important. Maybe George can touch on it when he's uh, summing up. <laughs> Sorry, George. Um, but um, anyway, let me, let me very, very quickly. Yes, and also we have a reception afterwards where the ambassador and uh, the negotiator are going to be there. So perhaps you can put those questions. Um, Jason, very quickly, should GMOs be incorporated into these discussions? Well, of course, it depends on who you ask. But uh, obviously, you're asking me. So uh, I would answer it like this. If you start allowing, uh, shall I say, moral judgments to creep into legally binding agreements, you'll never get anywhere. Um, if it's if there's a scientific case to prove that GMOs are harmful, then I think that there's a case to be made that they wouldn't be included. But if there's not, then there shouldn't be. Arnaud, you, you're, many of your members care very deeply about this issue, and, and so, uh, well, they all do probably, but on different sides. I would say it's a subject of a lot of discussion, yes. for sure. But uh, <laughs> at minimum, I would like to say, indeed, in Europe, we have a regulation, and the prime is the implementation of the regulation. It's not the issue, we have not a regulation. Uh, just to remind you, 39 GM is approved to put on the market, and mainly on feed. So that means there is something in place, but we... Probably from our, from our side, the issue is for cultivation. So, well, that, that's the main issue. Uh, concerning trade, I would like also to remind that the uh, Commission has made also some uh, proposal relating to feed. Now we have this low-level presence for feed, meaning to try to, to tackle this asynchronous approval between the, the two parts of the, of the Atlantic. And indeed, we see indeed is, is, there is no issue for negotiation, just applying the rules in already in place in the correct form. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I'd like to say, I don't know about you, but I think we've had a very, uh, very uh, good uh, sense of how things are going, both in the broader brush sense of the political priorities uh, guiding this from our earlier panel and also um, from uh, the gentleman here giving us a sense of the sort of intricacies from their perspectives of uh, what still remain the issues. Um, and we remain um, uh, interested uh, with your October the 12th uh, no, deadline. No, October. October. No. October. You weren't so precise, didn't you? Oh, no, 2012. I'm That's just, right. I'm just quoting the October po our political masters. <laughs> That's all. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll hold you to it. We'll gather on I'd October like it the to be September. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I, I, I'd like to now hand over to um, George Lyon now to uh, sum it all up for us. And um, thank you very much, all of you. And thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, uh, Sharon. Uh, I noticed how you, you passed the difficult question to me, but uh, I think I'm, actually I'm, the I'm ambassador actually going to can pass answer it, back it later. To, yes. to the panel, they can be spoken to afterwards <laughs> in the in the, the cocktails. Uh, it falls to me to to bring this uh, excellent uh, meeting to a conclusion. Uh, this is a very very important issue, uh, and I think uh, Ambassador Plunkett, in his opening remarks, uh, summoned, uh, uh, summed it up quite well when he said, uh, if we can actually secure a Canada-EU agreement, I think it does send out the right signal that uh, 
trade is actually part of the solution to the growth and to the crisis we have uh, around the world at the moment, uh, and that uh, it would be a signal uh, that both the EU and Canada reject any notion of a return to protectionism. So I think uh, it's very symbolic that we should actually see some progress on this and hopefully uh, maybe uh, some sort of agreement uh, in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I have to say, listening to uh, his introductory remarks, the ambassadors, uh, when he quoted that uh, Canada had recovered all of its growth lo lost after the crisis, 2.5% GDP growth expected for this year and 35% uh, of, uh, of, of its net debt position of GDP. I, I just uh, was green with envy, I have to say, given some of the challenges we face here uh, in Europe. But nevertheless, uh, I think trade is actually part of the solution to some of these challenges we face. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is very important that we do make progress and secure uh, uh, this deal. Uh, a 20% increase will create economic growth and create jobs, and we need to ensure that that's the focus of all our discussions uh, uh, when it comes to this. We learned, of course, of some of the barriers, or, or dare I say we're not allowed to call them barriers, challenges, uh, and they were, they were flagged up. Uh, can we wish uh, Joe well uh, when he when is integrating the, the two phone books together? Uh, it seems to me quite a, a challenging one when uh, trying to uh, amalgamate the rules of origin. And clearly a big, big job and, and one that's still to be uh, uh, completed. Uh, can I finally uh, conclude by thanking all the speakers? We've had excellent presentations. Uh, and thanks to Shireen's uh, excellent uh, chairmanship. Uh, there was no acceptance or wish washy answers. She cut it right to the, uh, you had to answer it completely. So, can I thank the speakers? Can I thank the uh, audience for turning up in such good numbers to listen to uh, a very informative debate? And can I wish the negotiators well? And let's hope it's not too long till we're here actually celebrating the conclusion of this free trade deal. Thank you very much indeed.